The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForum.com and IgnitionAPG.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 74. Our Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field to talk shop each week. If you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube or join our mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com to stay up to date with the latest episodes and anything else that we have going on. Excited to have Pete Bomarito with us. I've been trying to get Pete on the show for a while and, and our, just our schedules have not matched up, but Pete is a sp- sports performance coach down in, in Florida and, and has just done a fantastic job of building a great business down there and working with a lot of great athletes. And so I wanted to bring him on the show. We, we talked a little bit about um, his relationship building, how he's been able to maintain such a great relationship with his athletes, how he uh, has built his, his program there and, you know, just how he's been able to, to, you know, go into a situation where you have athletes for a short period of time and get the most bang for your buck, you know, and, 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 and get the most results in that short period of time. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Before we do, I want to make sure we recognize our sponsors, IgnitionAPG.com and EliteForm.com. EliteForm is a sports science company based in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they're just, you know, we've talked about them on the show quite a bit. I think the world of their product, they've been real busy lately. Um, you know, they just put in some... Uh, great jobs, you know, some some great institutions, University of Oklahoma, New Mexico State, um, Queensland Academy, Orlando Magic, Duke, you know, everybody is going to this um, sports science, you know, technology and trying to find the best way to integrate it all. And I think Elite Form has done a fantastic job of making it so that it's seamlessly integrated into what we try to do and so that you, you don't, you know, you're not all of a sudden being... Um, just a note taker. You're 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 staying being a coach and and letting the science kind of fit around your style, which I think is the critical piece. So make sure you check out EliteForm.com and see what they got going on. You get a free 90 uh, 90 day trial of the Strength Planner if you email IGCT at EliteForm.com. So uh, I definitely recommend that. You know, just making it easy to be able to create workouts and then push them to your athletes. So. Uh, make sure you check them out. Lastly, if you enjoy our, our podcast and you're a young strength coach, I think you'll really enjoy Strength Coach Basic Training. Strength Coach Basic Training is a online internship program uh, or coaching education program that I created uh, through the years of, of working with several intern classes, intern groups, and a lot of people going on. And, and essentially what it is, is it's an eight-lecture um, program and then a community of coaches um, that are there to help you uh, give feedback and get and, and ideas and network and and all those types of things. And so, you know, the very first checkpoint is building a strength conditioning cover letter and resume and references. And so, you watch the video. There's an assignment, a project, and then there's, like I said, it's the community of people that you're able to go through and learn from, see what they've done. They post theirs get feedback, all those kinds of things. And I know that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for just a little bit of feedback and, and other people that are in a similar situation to us. So check that out, strengthcoachbasictraining.com, sign up, and then it's a it's a private Facebook group that we uh, we put you in once you've you've joined. So uh, look forward to seeing some of you guys there. All right, I want to get to Pete. I had a great conversation with him. I know you'll enjoy it. We'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, excited to have Pete Bomarito with us. You know, Pete, uh, I've known for a long time. We've spoken at clinics together, and, and a guy that's, you know, when I was at South Florida that we would, you know, guys would go down and train with, and just a guy that has a, a great um, rapport with his athletes, great rapport in the league, great rapport with coaches, and uh, has been able to get results out of his guys for lots and lots of years. So, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
you know, Pete, talk, you know, let's go into your journey a little bit, you know, kind of what got you into strength and conditioning and then kind of how you, you know, been able to get to where you're currently at. I mean, this is a, I mean, from as far back as I remember, this is all I've ever wanted to do. You know, it got to the point where as I became older, I became less interested in sports and more interested in training. Like the sport for me was just almost to see if my training worked and how well it worked. I mean, I got that obsessed with it. I was that obsessed with science and it just fit. I mean, my strength is always uh, math and science and biomechanics and physics. And I was just, I, I was fascinated by it at a young age. So when I got my master's degree at, at Ball State, you know, I, I was definitely, I'd say um, it was a benefit to me to study under Dr. Kramer. And he just kind of took my brain of where I wanted to go, him and Dr. Newton, some of the best scientific minds in the industry, and just opened up, I'd say, you know, my mind to the where this could really go. As much as I was obsessed with math and physics and physiology, and especially biomechanics, you know, I always felt that, uh, you know, joint forces and from a speed training standpoint, strength training standpoint, you know, we could definitely take this industry and, and, and just push it into the forefront. Um, you know, so from there, I went to the Colts. I was a, I was an assistant strength coach at Ball State. I started as a, as a college strength coach, and I'm glad I did, really, because I had that mentality. I think that I kind of fell backwards into the private sector. I did it because I just found a good, high-paying job, and I was young. Right. And I thought it would be a good stepping stone to get back into a college position that I wanted. But I having so much success in the private sector, here's where I stayed. And I think a lot of that success I've had – is attributed to the mentality that you learn when you start as a college strength coach. And my first boss, I mean, everything he taught me about, as you said, relationship building and understanding the team atmosphere and the psychology of it and the team building and the mental toughness. You get a crash course in that when you get to a high level division one uh, strength conditioning position. And I just carry that mentality over to the private sector. I mean, everybody always says that it seems like I'm running a team down here. And I have that type of, of intensity and competitive atmosphere because that's all I know how to do. That's how I was born and, and bred in this field. Absolutely. Well, you, you brought that up, and that's something that you know we, we I've always respected about to, respected about you, and you know that is is the rapport you have with your athletes. I mean, you know, there's so many. You know, you're one of the one of the first guys that started in the sports performance industry, but you've helped build it to what it is. But there's there's thousands of them now, right? But anybody can get a guy to come train with them once but to get guys to continually come back and believe in you and respect you and and constantly you know know that you're on top of your game and, and you're cutting edge and all those things that's a that's a hard sell anymore you know and, and you continually do it year in and year out and have a, a, a great following with your athletes what, what are some of the ways that you build that type of relationship with your athletes well obviously it's going to sound cliche but everything's based on trust and this is something that i'm always talking to my young coaches my interns even my accountants and my business advisors, you know, they're, they, they say a lot of things like I'm going to run a program and with my nutrition program, we could cut the overhead cost in half if we went and did it like everybody else does it. Look right. at this company that goes to this performance center and this company. But I honestly do believe there's a difference. I know the athlete might not completely understand the difference between organic and organic grass fed, but I firmly believe that that's how you get results. And if you – Spend the money on the things that matter, like nutrition and nutrient timing. You go through all that detail. I know that it's very difficult to do because you're spending so much time on it. You don't see an immediate return. I just firmly believe that at the end of the day, athletes will see a difference. And if you have their their interests at heart, you're not always looking at the immediate financial return, you're going to get them as consistent clients. And long term, that's how you're going to build a business. And I've always had that philosophy on every aspect, whether it's strength or speed or what – money we're going to spend on equipment, what money we're going to spend on continuing education, technology. Um, I'm a big believer in spending a lot of money, especially on continuing ed. I mean, it drives my accountants crazy, but I think it's important. I pay for a lot of not just certifications, but overall education with my staff. I absolutely mandate it. And I up their pay scale based on their level of education experience. I think it's important. So overall, I think when you do those little things, at the end of the day, the athlete is going to see the difference, and sure. that's what's going to make them consistent clients. Well, likewise, you've got a great relationship with uh, with coaches around the league, you know, with strength coaches, and sometimes you know as well as I do that that can sometimes be in an adversarial type of relationship where, you know, all this guy's trying to claim or get credit or this out of the other, and it's quite the opposite with you. It's it's a, it's a very it's a, it's it's a mutual respect for sure. 
talk a little bit about how you've been able to build relationships with coaches. Um, well, it, is, it is a fine line you have to walk. I mean, yeah. being in the private sector, you have to promote. The, I, one thing that I do that I do well is I stay away from it. You know, I have a social media team and I have a marketing team, and I put rules and regulations in place that they have to follow. As of, we can't be too arrogant. You can't go too overboard. You can never ever talk bad about one of your competitors. I mean, there's there, and I could go on and on about the rules I put in place to be professional and respectful. But taking myself out of that realm, I think, helps a lot because yeah. I don't want to get too deep into the marketing and social media because it just, I don't know, it just, I, I think that it kind of devalues myself as a hardcore coach, you know. So that is a walking a fine line because you know I have friends in the league and they always, uh, you know, give me a hard time this and that about what's on YouTube, but it's all in fun. But I think moreover, it's just you know showing respect to everybody. Yeah, um, and that's across multiple sports. It's not just in the NFL, right? You know, Rob. I think I'm known the most, but Major League Baseball. You know, we go to the conference every year, and we spend money, and we and we sponsor the PBATs or the Professional Strength and Conditioning Association. We sponsor them. We just say, look, you know, we're not here to even tell you to recommend your players to be here. All we want to do is say that we're a resource. We're in Miami. We're in Fort Lauderdale. If your player does reside here, I want to know. I want you to know that what we have to offer. And if you want to come to me and say, "This is the exact rehab program. This is the exact strength program. This is what I want my player doing." If he's going to walk through your door, if you can implement this, that would be great. And we've done that many times. You know, I have no problem with helping out and being a supportive role to these players. I, I, I say it all the time. You know, these players are not my clients or clients of their respective teams. Right. And got to show that respect. And that, that's not just a strength coach. It's the athletic trainer, the nutritionist, the physical therapist, the orthopedic. Um, we try to get involved as much as we possibly can. Of, of course, that's within the rules of these collecting bargaining agreements because it is a, it's a fine line. You can't, Absolutely. you can communicate, but you can't take any directives because that's specifically what the union stipulates. Yeah, absolutely. Well, with the CBA and with, the, you know, it's gotten better for sure as far as the amount of time that you're able to, to work with athletes now. But, you know, and just in, in general, in combine prep or, you know, a lot of times you're getting athletes that are trying to find a quick fix. Maybe they're in between ball clubs or whatever, and they're coming down. How are you able to, to you know, what are some of the things that you see as general trends of, you know, an athlete walking in the door, you knowing that you have a short amount of time and, and you're like, this is, I, I know these are things that I need to be working on with these athletes. And this is, I know that they can see results quickly with X, Y, and Z. I mean, so, I'd say this, number one, guaranteed hands down, it's medical. It's medical. It's the biggest piece of advice I can give anybody is get medically trained and have a solid medical system. And this is beyond just the standard biomechanical evaluations you see across the board. I'm not saying those things are bad. They're good. Get trained in a screening process, a biomechanical evaluation process. Get your training. Get it well. But you've got to go well above and beyond. Like a lot of these screenings might tell you what is wrong. It won't tell you why. And you can't just dump it off on a physical therapist or have a relationship with a trainer or have a relationship with a massage or a chiropractor. you got to build a team. Get a medical team under your thumb. And even if it's to where you can't afford to bring them in and you have a bunch of independent contractors, get a solid team of, of people in place that everybody communicates with each other and gets things accomplished. You know, it's one of the main things I learned when I got to the NFL is you've got to have a solid team where nobody's combating each other. Everybody understands there's overlap between the disciplines. There's an overlap between an athletic trainer, strength conditioning coach. Mm -hmm. But you got to respect the overlap and allow people to do their jobs but also work together for the common goal. And that's the biggest thing I've seen. Uh, uh, you know, with, with somebody comes in in a short amount of time, the fact that I am MAT Jumpstart trained. I've trained every one of my coaches in MAT Jumpstart. I am a certified MAT specialist now. A lot of my chiropractors are MAT and ART and acupuncture, Graston, there's, we have multiple people that are certified in multiple medical disciplines. And I think strength and conditioning coaches need to take that leap into understanding the RTS principles, getting into physics, going strong into some type of neuromuscular work. Not necessarily joint palpations, but something like the jump start that allows for joint based iso isometrics. You know, yeah. taking it one step further. And that, that's the key aspect. You get somebody for the NFL combine, for example. You know, they're going to come out of the season in, in early January. Then they're going to go to the Senior Bowl. They're, they're coming out of the season wrecked. I mean, we don't have to reinvent the wheel with, like, the most involved, intense, high-level 
track and field sprint training. You got to get them healthy, get their joints aligned, let their natural genetic athleticism take shape. And then once you're no, we know that you've built a solid foundation of getting their joints back in alignment and getting all the scar tissue and the inflammation, everything reduced. Then you can hit them hard with all of your philosophical approaches to movement and strength. But the key aspect is get them in the weight room strong and fast early on and build a foundation before you get into all the movement. I think that a lot of times people just, you know, lose sight of the basics of joint alignment, reducing inflammation, getting strong in the weight room, producing force. And then all the little speed training things you're going to do is just going to naturally take shape. People jump the gun too much and try to get into track and field style training with with guys that are just beat up and big and heavy and you know ends up being a mess. And you take the same approach with my baseball, football, even tennis, lacrosse, golf, all of them. They're, even if they have a perennial sport they're going to play all year round like tennis, there's going to be a time in the offseason where you can get them to recover and reload sure. and, and train through. And I, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, unintelligently trained through tournaments, but some tournaments you've got to train through. you got to peak for the big ones, and you have to have uploads and downloads. So understanding the full biomechanics of the body. I mean, so many interns come through here to have a master's degree, yet do not know the basic anatomy of attachment sites and the, phil- and the physiology and don't understand joint forces and levers and moment arms and axis of rotation. Right. Those things have got to be put into play when you're looking at – what is the specificity of a program? Stop thinking football specific or running back specific and think specific to this injury, this injury history, this wear and tear, this joint alignment, this asymmetry and range of motion. That's what makes it specific. And I think that if you follow that rule, mm-hmm. the the progress you're going to make is going to take care of itself sure. if you stay disciplined. You know, the, the, with the CBA, and now it's gotten to where it can be more of a, a, a true off season or a true, you know, your that that combine prep or or your your returning players um, that are coming back for the off season. What what does a typical training week look like for you for a football program or football player returning, you know, in the off season? I mean, in the NFL uh, early in the we basically have four phases. Like pretty much the standard is if you're going to have. A sport like football, you're going to go through four phases. You know, phase one is right after the season, and then phase two is going to be gearing towards either spring ball or OTAs. So spring ball, obviously, if you're in high school or college, and OTAs if you're a pro. Then you come out and you're in phase three, which is after spring ball, after OTAs, and then phase four is training for training camp. So just like a standard, what I did when I was a college strength coach, we have four main phases. So a typical week is going to change, obviously, in the, in the phase, but Early on, it's, uh, I mean, there's guys that spend five hours a day here, but maybe 90 minutes of training, but the rest of it is up in the medical room, getting your body healthy quick. You shift in gears, then when you have a true ch- actual training week, we like to go three hours a day, five days a week, you know, and with the middle day being a lot of unloaded work, like pool work. Um, but I'd say on Monday, we do high neural prep, low joint loading. Tuesday, heavy into linear speed and a lot of resistive work. Wednesday, recovery in the pool. Thursday is more of our position-specific day, and then Friday is our metabolic conditioning day. Then we have the standard splits. We'll we'll go upper, lower, upper, lower. Sometimes we'll go full body on a strength power split. One of our more popular things I'm getting really into is going full body four days a week, but going single joint, multi-joint. You know, We have so much success with single joint exercises, lower body, that you take like a wide receiver, for example, especially somebody that does not like to lift, like a wide receiver and a defensive back. And, you know, what, what do they really need to accomplish upper body lifting wise? I mean, have a, have a strong press, a strong pull, do some shoulder work, uh, a lot of prehab work in the shoulders, and then get them into all their multi-directional force of single joint hip, single joint, joint knee, single joint ankle. Then on the next day, hit them with all of their power based stuff and multi-joint lifts. And, and I know it's a little unorthodox, but we have a lot of success with it, you know, um, and not just single joint work of actual work, but single joint isometrics. Yeah, isometric of flexion, extension, abduction combinations, but doing like 10 to 30 second holds and putting different directional forces on that's specific to their inhibitions. When we start doing things like that, we're noticing a drastic increase in lower body production. So it's taking a standard strength program. You're going to know it's going to make somebody strong. And the day before you hit that lower body work, you want to make sure that the hips are aligned, the knees aligned, the ankles are aligned. 
And with a sport like football that's so intense and they have so much wear and tear coming off, we have a lot of success of that early on. And then once we switch, yeah, we like to hit heavy conjugate dynamic phases. I'm a big believer in variable loading. I like dynamic work. I like my max effort work. I like doing power peaks and complex supersets and, uh, uh, you know, those types of things is going to peak power. Right. You know, anything that, that, that like that. And then as we come early in the off season, I think it's more linear based just to let the joints recover. And we slowly start working in our change direction mechanics later in the off season. Right. I mean, that philosophy obviously works with football, but that's also a standard philosophy we take across all the sports. Sure. Even sports like volleyball and tennis and lacrosse, um, you're going to have a true off season. It's just going to be shorter and they're not going to stop playing or like soccer, you know, and, and that's fine. You know, I've always had the philosophy, don't come back to sport coaches, let them do what they do. Just be more intelligent with your recovery. And if you do that, you're going to, you're going to sell a person like a, like a high level soccer player. And fortunately we've had some of those people come through the door, major right. collegiate players, even professional players overseas. You know, you you were uh, several years back, you know, you and I talked, and, and you were one of the first guys that I knew of that was really putting the uh, reactive agility into their program, you know, and, and, and being, you know, really making it a, a major part. You know, is that something that you're starting, you know, you talk about linear and then you work in the lateral, and then is it the progression then into the reactive, or is there, are you starting day one with, you know, reactive agility and then just progressing to a higher intensity? There's the- definitely a progression into it. Now, you have to take it with a grain of salt because sometimes you have to sell. I don't care if you're in the NFL, Major League Baseball, Major so- Major League Soccer, whatever you are, college, you have to sell. Yep. So you got to do what the coaches want, what the athletic director wants, the parents want, whatever. I mean, sometimes you you got to – you know, people that don't understand physics and biomechanics are going to revert back and want everything sport-specific. They want it to mimic their sport. They want you to recreate motions, which I don't agree with. Right. I agree with training muscles, not motions. So I looked at agility training, change direction, and especially reactive agility training. I look at it as what it is. I mean, it's it's a high speed eccentric load. It's a powerful stretch reflex. You're looking at stored elastic energy. You're looking at raising thresholds. You're training muscles at very specific angles, at very specific joint angles. And you know, the, I want to train that high speed eccentric loading. So. Yeah, I would prefer if I was doing it in a general sense early on to let me build up the tolerance to stored elastic energy. Let me raise the threshold. Let me get the eccentric work, the high-speed eccentric work, and then get the reversal strength. All that plays into an agility. So I'd rather spend a lot of time training the muscles and then getting into the application later on in the offseason. So we'll still do it early on. Right. But I'd say if, if let's say if it's 10% of my overall movement training early on, it might progress up to maybe 50 to 60% over in, in the offseason or like later on in the offseason. And, and usually it works. I mean, if, if people let us do what we want to do. So as opposed to doing a sprint and a jump cut sprint, we might <clears throat> do some lateral bounds, but on the pause, it's like a five second pause. So yeah. get that eccentric and, Usually what coaches are that, you know, they, they see you bounding and not really running, but those types of bounds, and I'm not talking about a bound and a change direction. I'm talking about a bound, a high eccentric, and then an isometric pause for five, 10 seconds. You know, that wrecks guys. And that's right. what coaches a lot of time want to see. Are you working? Are people sweating? Are they people getting the burn? Whatever. Right. So sometimes you can win the battle by doing what you want to do. So I would say for sure, hands down, you've got to build those aspects and, it all starts in the weight room. Can you get the eccentric strength, get the eccentric uh, high speed strength, get the dynamic unloading, the, the reversal? That's why a lot of people do Olympic lifts. You know, I prefer to do unloaded, uh, I'm sorry, variable loaded speed squats where you can dive bomb a squat and things like that to build that. But once you build that, it just goes in the foundation. And then once all the muscles are built, then we start getting into the reactive. Okay, yep. As opposed to reacting to a plan change of direction, can you execute the muscle action you've now developed in a state where you're you're reacting to a visual and or verbal stimulus? And, you know, that's a lot of times my marketing team loves to put online. But that's definitely uh, like, like I'd say a smaller person early on and no more than 50 percent later on. Yeah. And we have success with that. You know, with, with all these different programs out there and, and you know, um, 
sports performance facilities and things along those lines. What what makes your program unique? What where do you think that you you really um, you know separate yourself? You know, it's hard for me to say because you know, to my fault, I should travel around more. I really need to start getting out and look what other people are doing. Um, I haven't spoke that much. You know, I've really been focusing on my expansion, the university, and all the things that I'm doing. So all I can really say is what players have told me that have been elsewhere and come to me. And it's usually not anything bad. I mean, you know, for the most part, it's nothing negative. It's, you know, because I don't want to think like I'm better than anybody else. But what one thing that people have continuously said is definitely our approach to medical. You know, I think they – I didn't know it was that unique, but people have brought it kind of to my forefront that – you know, you look at every one of my coaches and they're all trained neuromuscular therapists. And, and I don't expect them to get to me on the table for an hour. But once you go through that style of training and you start to really understand joint forces, it makes you so much of a better coach when you're looking at on the fly, can you individualize something in a large group setting? You know, and that's, I think that that's how my mind works. And that's why I want all my coaches to work. So people have said that they always say that, you know, you guys, it's unique that you run it like a team, like you have competitive groups. You might have 20, 30 NFL guys on the field right. at a time, every hour on the hour. But you have six coaches out there that are medically trained, and if this person needs this joint force and this person needs that modification, you still have that competitive environment, but you have all the things that's specific to your body, your injury history. We read medical reports. People get medical work every single day, and we're not allowed to touch them until I read that report and manipulate the training based off that. And then I read responses. I'm big on recovery and quantifiable recovery. So people have said that that approach is fairly unique. Um, The other thing I think, um, this might just be for the private sector anyway, is we get after it in the weight room. I I got that college mentality. You (laughs) you have to. I think that my... One pet peeve in this industry is people that don't like to get aggressive in the weight room. You, right. you gotta, you gotta stay true to your profession. You gotta get with people, learn under people. Don't try to chase the buck too early. Get under real strength coaches that know how to get people strong. Right. And and safely though, obviously it's always going to be about joint alignment. I mean, I'm not saying we don't do GPP phases because we do. We're very intelligent with it, but you can be intelligent and aggressive at the same time. Agreed. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. What you know when you, when you first got into coaching, or even in, you know could be just recently, what's what's the best piece of coaching advice that you received? It was definitely John Tareen. Um, you know that that's my idol. That's my guy. Um, Stud. Indianapolis uh, Colts strength coach. You know I only interned under him for one summer, but I probably learned more from that man in three months than I've learned in my entire career. And it, it was mainly just the psychology. I mean the the way he got his players to buy into him. You know, he always used to say it that, you know, some of the most intelligent strength and conditioning coaches out there you probably have never heard of. You know, you could be the biggest genius, the best program writer, everything, but you have got to be able to sell it to your players. Right. And this is before I even thought I'd ever in a million years end up in the private sector. I wanted to be him. I wanted to go to college, go to pro. Right. And he always used to talk about the sell. You've got to make sure that you're selling and you can't, you got to. Respect your profession. If you don't know the answer, you better go find the answer because athletes will figure it out. You know, you're BS them after a while. So you just basically, if you have an athlete in front of you and you see something that they're doing wrong, within five seconds, you got to be able to formulate in your head how to articulate to them that's advanced enough that they understand it, but not Mickey Mouse enough that you're offending them. Right. And if you can do that, you can be in this profession. I remember, I, I remember when he said that to me, I seriously <laughs> wrote it down and put it on my mirror. And I read it every day. And every wow. situation I went into, I tried to think of that statement. And it's hard. That is very difficult when you're a young coach. It is. But if you have that in your mind and you always try to stay true to that profession, and he always said, if somebody asks you a question, or you're confronted with a situation and you don't know. There's nothing. I mean, he's not saying go ahead and say I don't know. Right. Don't BS your way through it. But right. you better go figure out the answer fast. And I think that's why I'm so much into continuing education because I t- got tired of doing educated guesses. Right. I wanted to be specific, and um, I've always had that mentality. And I, you know, I thank him for it. I think I'm very successful because of what he's taught me. No, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, what it took for me was having kids of my own. You know, and, and, and seeing them do things and trying to be able to explain to them what they're doing uh, without using scientific jargon, you know, and, and uh, that's hard sometimes, you know. And so you really, you know, but it makes you a better coach because 
you walk into that football staff meeting or you walk you know into that group of athletes and you have to be able to explain it in a way that they can believe and trust and and know um that you got their their best interest at heart that you but you're also giving them an answer to their their problem and I couldn't agree more with that what um you know we we kind of always in these shows Pete, with some, some resources, what, what's a quote that you have plastered up in your weight room or one that you've kind of lived by? A quote? I mean, I, this is going to sound kind of cheesy, honestly, but it, it's – I'm not trying to sell RTS. I have no affiliation with them whatsoever, but I have a physics mind. I have a master's degree in biomechanics. That's where the way my brain thinks, and that certification or that, that training system absolutely blew me away. It was the one thing that I've taken – that more than anything else I've ever seen, they take principles of physics and organize it in your brain. It allows your brain to stay organized with regards to physics, and they have an equation of what exercise equals. And um, you know, it's a it's a complex, looks like it's a physics equation of, and they talk about things like intention. You know, the things we we start to to, to forget of. This is an exercise, but this is the athlete's intention during the exercise, you know, right. and all those things. They talk about appropriateness, you know, because people are always asking me, young coaches, is this good? Is this bad? Is this right? Is this wrong? And I'm like, that's not the question you'd ask. Right. The question you'd ask is, is this appropriate? So we do. I will admit it. We have that equation plastered up, and I talk right. about that equation a lot. What does exercise equal? And I got to give them credit because I wish I would have thought of something like that. It seems simple. Yeah, it's a little great. bit cliche, but there's nothing more true to the approach of exercise is looking at all the variables that they consider what exercise really is. Yeah, uh, that's cool. What about a um, – and it doesn't have to be a strength conditioning resource. It could be something business or uh, productivity or whatever, but a book, an app, and a website recommendation. Um, you know, the book always goes back to Zatsiorsky. I know it's an old book, but I, I, you know, little green book, the Bible, the green Bible, we call it. You know? I mean, that, that just, I keep going back to that over and over and over again. You know, I, I, it's, it's a, it's a great book. I can reference it because they detail out everything. When I was young, it did blow me away. Right. But as I got more educated in joint forces and physiology and uploads and downloads and recovery and nervous system versus cellular versus everything. You know, it, it it really comes back to the basics of how the body functions. And I, I hate to sound like an old coach, and that's an old book, but it does really. It, it's very appropriate. You know, um, you know. In terms of research, I just go back to Newton and Kramer, and I know I might be biased because they chaired my thesis, but Dr. Kramer out of UConn, Dr. Newton out of uh, you know the Sports Science Institute in Australia. Yep. You know, I tell people a lot that if you're looking for the hormonal response to various mechanisms, you know, there's nobody better than Kramer. And and under, I always t try to teach people how to read research. Don't read it for the programs they're writing. Understand the hormonal response we're trying to get and adapt it. Or uh, you know, post activation potentiation. I mean, obviously. Yep. If people have seen my stuff and written and read my articles and everything, I base my whole strength program around that concept. And you know, I'm not saying Newton invented it, but he's definitely the one that kept proving time and time again different effective methods at using post activation potentiation. Yeah. Uh, so I, I reference those two guys a lot, and um, that and they haven't slowed down at all. The the research they put out is dynamic; it blows me away every single time. You got an app or a website you recommend? Website, Bomber University. Come yeah. on. Yeah, we're going yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna to play that one for sure. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, I mean, definitely, um, you know, I'd say Brickashansky's Bers uh, website's really good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely into that science. Uh, you know, I, I read everything. You know, I'm into powerlifting. I'm, I'm into Olympic lifting. You know, I like reading, you know, some of the, you know, Thibodeau stuff up in Canada. I like reading some of Louis Simmons stuff out of West Side. Yeah. Um, even the juggernaut guys, I'm starting to get involved with them. You know, I, I spoke at a conference over the summer um, and I saw Chad Wesley Smith and those guys. So uh, Dave Tate and all his stuff. You know, I definitely like reading what's coming out of the powerlifting communities, you know, um, but, you know, because the, the approach can be adapted over. You know, and over on the speed side, obviously, my guy, you know, Lauren Seagrave, you know, I mean, I, I worked under him. So 
I'm obviously heavily influenced by him. Right. I still think that he is the one track and field coach that has successfully transferred over, and the 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 industry of multi directional you know performance coaches is lucky to have a guy like that. No doubt. And everything he does, everything he speaks on, you know, he's so he's all over tons of websites. No and then periodization models obviously doesn't get any better than Esteban Bali. So um, Esteban is – I know that his stuff definitely is, is you know, geared towards the Olympic training centers because that's what he's known for. But right. there's no doubting that his approach, his approach to long-term and even short-term periodization models is brilliant. And even if I have a guy for six weeks, I take his models of 12 years and cram it into six weeks because <laughs> that – Periodization model is, is phenomenal. I mean, even Isherin with his block periodization stuff, yeah. he's got some stuff online now. So, yeah, those are all the things I read from strength, speed, and and periodization model. Oh, that's great. Well, you talked about it. You know, um, you know, Bomberito University. Tell us a little bit about that. I know it's it's a great resource, and and um, I know a lot of the coaches that are listening would be interested. Well, we definitely try to give back. You know, that originally that's what it was. It was such a demand for it. Um, and you know, luckily I have a good business advisor that put it into a model for me. You know, he had a lot of experience with this and, and he just kept showing me, he's like, listen, you, you get request after request after request. And a lot of your requests are starting to come from trainers and coaches just as much as athletes, you know, so why don't we put it together and do it right? And it's going to be set up scientifically the way you want. So we do have a database online, but because people request a lot, but I'm going to go, you know, a couple steps further. We have these weekend workshops where, we give them a, an entire crash course to not just our approach and philosophy, but what is our interpretation of literature and science, especially current science. And, you know, so it's not just here is the Bomberito speed training protocol. Right. It's these are the concepts we've developed. And I want you to understand the concept. Like we give them a active dynamic warm up that if you did the entire page, it would take them two hours. Sure. I'd say this is a database of exercise. This is not a system. This is our approach to absorbing force, redirecting force, accepting body weight, redirecting it. That is what you have to build, understanding thresholds and and uh, joint forces, everything that goes along with it. So it's a crash course of philosophical approach. You know, Plus, we're getting coaches and athletes to say, listen, I can't afford to come down, but I have this, 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 and this. What would you recommend? And we don't just give them a program. We give them an approach of things to think about. Um, plus we are going to get into advanced certification modules of people that want to get specialized in linear speed or elite football combines or baseball off season or what's really getting big now is boot camps. You know, we run a boot camp. We do have a personal training side of things a non-athletic side of things. And I run it the way we run everything else. I don't know any better. I, I do a full medical evaluation of everybody. We train them in a competitive atmosphere, but everything's individualized and specific to what their sport is. And their sport might be, I want to walk them downstairs without pain, but their sport might be, I want to play recreational basketball. Right. I, I love doing it and I can't do it without pain anymore. Or their sport just might be, I'm 25 years old. I'm a business guy, but I played college football. I missed that style of training. Right. I can't be the guy that just goes into an ergonomically correct cardiovascular <laughs> machine and stare at a wall. I want to be active. That's you know. Right. So if that's their sport, that's what we do. And surprising to me, that's our biggest request of trainers that w- run these boot camps or group fitness classes that want to understand how to evaluate somebody and make it individualized in a group setting, no, which is what we do. So there's a lot of aspects of the university. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And, you know, that's the biggest thing. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show is that, you know, through the years, as much as, as you've been able to, you've, you've constantly given back in, in speaking and writing and things like that. But, you know, um, you know, obviously the business takes a lot of toll on that. But this university that you put out and um, and just, the, you know, the workshops that you're doing now is such a it's such a great concept and great idea and, and, and making the profession better. And that's what we're always trying to do. So... Man, I, this has been awesome. I appreciate you coming on the show and spending some time on, on, a, on a Monday night. But um, I really, I really appreciate you sharing with everybody, brother. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on again. Thanks, buddy. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. 
Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefrey.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefrey's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefrey in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash ron.mckeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.